Welcome to the unassuming A380 home of Asia. We're in Bangkok, Thailand, where the airport sees an abnormally high amount of A380s comparatively to the region's other airports. Today we'll be trying out the first class cabin aboard Asiana's A380 on an early morning flight from Bangkok to Seoul Incheon. Asiana has 12 seats on their A380s in a first class setup. These seats used to be marketed and sold as first class but are now under the name Business Select. Essentially it's a business class ticket but with an upgraded seat, the same seat that used to be sold as first class. Now I hope I'm pronouncing this right, but Suwanapum Airport is Bangkok's 16 year old airport whose best feature is these zigzagging people movers that move like magic carpets, rather than having standard escalators to take you in between the levels. Now it may be almost midnight here in this busy Southeast Asian airport, but it's as packed as ever. Large numbers of people were scattered all throughout the airport. We found our check-in desk in row K, but it was still closed. Interestingly enough, counters here only open three hours before departure, which seems low considering around the world, you'll often find counters opening four to six hours before departure. So to kill some time, I walked around checking out what pre-security entertainment Bangkok's airport had to offer. Obviously plenty of art, as that's one of Thailand's specialties, things like this beautiful temple looking thing, or these statues that were at the end of each check-in row all the way down. After that, I found a balcony at the top level of the terminal with a label, Observation Deck. So obviously I had to go check that out. They did have a big escalator going up solely to the ticketing offices and the Observation Deck, and from up there I could have a big sweeping view of the check-in areas. From there, a short ramp took me upstairs. The observation deck has its pluses and minuses. For starters, it's completely indoors, which does make it a bit harder to see everything outside, especially at night. But luckily, since Thailand can get so warm and humid, you are protected from the outside elements at least. My next source of entertainment was watching these two printers race to finish their respective stacks of paper. Now my tip for you, especially if you get hot typically. These metal grates are air conditioning units scattered frequently throughout the terminal. Since I kept getting warm in the terminal, I decided to sit out the rest of my weight in front of one of these. Before long, I saw people lining up at the Asiana counters, even before any employees had shown up, so I figured it couldn't hurt to at least get in line. I also just barely cut off this wonderful moment where the entire ticket counter staff bowed to us before taking their posts and accepting passengers. After check-in, I received my boarding pass. Note that it says business and not first, since my seat is just an upgraded business class seat. I also received another pass for lounge access. We will check out the lounge shortly, but Asiana doesn't have their own lounges here. Passengers instead are granted access to the Thai Airways business class lounges or the Miracle lounges around the airport. Fortunately, they did staple a map to my lounge pass in order to help me find those. For security in Bangkok, they do have a product known as Fast Track, which is open for a group of different people to get a priority lane through immigration and security. It does definitely shorten the wait time, but because so many people fit the description of these limited passengers, there was still a bit of a line. I would say it took about 10 to 15 minutes, although the main line looked to be easily over half an hour. Once through immigration and security, you find yourself in the main hub of the terminal. The airport's set up with us entering right in the middle, then there's branches in both directions with spokes coming off of those, but all as one main terminal, making transfers super easy. The first thing you'll see is a whole slew of duty-free shops in both directions. Since they have so many individual shops, rather than just a few big ones, they seem to go on forever. It seemingly took forever to reach the lounges or the gates, but it did give me a chance at least to see a little bit more art as I walked through the terminal. My hunt, however, was for the main of Thai Airways' lounges as the ticket counter employee told me that it was the largest and nicest of their multiple locations throughout the airport. Following a whole bunch of signs guided me to the entrance of Thai Airways' biggest lounge here in Bangkok, the Royal First and Royal Silk, or Business Class Lounges. Down the escalator, they scanned my boarding pass and directed me to the right, to the Royal Silk Lounge, labeled only here as the Royal Orchid Lounge, which was a bit confusing. I was bummed, however, not to have access to the first class lounge, but I guess that just means I have to come back in the future. Now time-lapsing my walk here through the entirety of this Royal Silk Lounge, just taking a stroll throughout, it was absolutely massive. 
You can see a large amount of seating options with fake greenery throughout, making it super cozy. The only issue I would say is that it was very crowded and there wasn't many private spots and the ones that did exist were mostly occupied. So there was plenty of places to sit, but don't expect to have the space to yourself. Now, if there's one thing that I love about Thailand, it's just all the different types of food that you can get here. It seems to all be amazing. Unfortunately, about half the food in the lounge is Western cuisines, and it was definitely subpar. But what that meant was that the rest of the food was all local cuisine, stuff that you would find native to Thailand or other areas of Southeast Asia. And all of this food was absolutely amazing. They had plenty of entrees and side dishes. And if you got those together, you could get yourself a full meal of local cuisine. And it was some of the best lounge food I'd ever had. Now, if you've watched my channel, you know that one of my favorite parts of these long travels is getting access to the shower rooms, as I love getting on board feeling completely refreshed. The shower suites here were in super nice remodeled rooms with plenty of space to spread out your stuff, use all the space to your full abilities, but that being said, the one drawback of this room is it was extremely humid, and so by the time you stepped out of the shower, you were already getting sticky from the humidity once again. After my shower, I actually did have quite a bit of time before my flight boarded, about 30 minutes to an hour, but I decided I would use that time to go walk around the airport as there wasn't really some great places to sit. So I left the lounge and headed out towards the E-Gates, which is where I was going to be departing from today. Now I definitely want to compliment the signage throughout this airport. They do a great job of pointing you in the right direction while also telling you exactly how long it'll take at a normal walking speed to get there. So if you do want to spend more time shopping, you can time out your walk to your gate a little bit better. Like I mentioned, coming off of the central hub here in Bangkok, you can go out in either direction. Here we've reached the end of one of those directions where there's instead three separate smaller spokes coming off of it, which is where you're actually going to find the gates, considering that central hub is mostly just shops and some local smaller aircraft. This side of the terminal seemed to be the non-Thai Airways international flights, at least this time of the day, but it also seemed to have the most American cuisine, which is interesting because at the current time, there is no non-stop flights from Thailand to the Americas, although there has been in the past. We finally reached the E-Gates. You can see on the sign all the different lounges that are located here. However, because I had spent so much time walking around, I didn't actually have time to go into any more lounges. Instead, I just walked past my fourth Dairy Queen of the day and down towards the E-Gates. And here you can see the grand open setup. That is what basically all the wings of gates here look like in Bangkok's airport. It's a multi-level setup where you can walk upstairs and downstairs in the center is the pathway out to immigration and out on the sides is the individual stairs that take you down to each boarding gate. Gate Echo 8 was gonna be ours today. They had a quick document check at the top of the stairs. And then from there, we were able to head downstairs to an individual gate holding area just for our flight to Incheon. From upstairs, we were able to head down this ramp, down to the seating area where there was places to sit or use the restroom, so don't have to worry if you're sitting there for too long while you wait for boarding to open. We had about 15, 30 minutes more as the inbound crew was still just getting off the airplane. But it did give me time to check out our Aegean A380 before we boarded. However, because you can't get right up against the windows here in Bangkok, I wasn't able to get the greatest view with all the glares at nighttime. And so I had to wait until we got to Seoul to get the best views of this airplane. I was amazed at how big the seating area was considering we had the largest passenger jet in the world. And even still, the seating area for just this gate didn't even get half full. As I sat here, I watched the Qatar A380 taxi back in the background, which is actually what I flew into Thailand the night before. If you haven't seen that video, go check that out. It's one of my favorite flights that I have been on to date. Now, Asiana doesn't have too many A380s, and the ones they do have are usually within Asia with the occasional LAX flight. 
That being said, they no longer have first class seats per se. It is the exact same seat, but it is now sold as business class and you just have to pay an extra few hundred dollars in order to reserve this seat. So the only thing that really has changed is they've downgraded the service from a first class service to a business class service and it did seem to show on this flight and I will talk about that shortly. The other thing that's interesting is unlike most of these airplanes, the business suites or first class seats are on the lower deck of the airplane. They're all the way in the front, but on a lot of A380s you find the premium cabins upstairs. That's not the case here on board this airplane. Now one of the things you're going to notice different by downgrading the service from a first class seat to a business class seat is that they don't escort you to your seat, which they usually do in first class. Obviously this isn't a necessary touch, but it is a notable difference when you are used to flying first class and you're now in a business class seat. Now booking window seats was tough. When I was looking at these flights, I could only reserve a middle seat. However, when I checked in at the ticket counter, they were able to upgrade me to a window seat due to my Star Alliance priority. So I'm not sure if they save seats specifically for Star Alliance priority members, but if you know, definitely let me know down in the comments. The middle seats were actually pretty good if you're traveling with someone. They don't turn into a double bed like some seats do nowadays, but the divider does come down and you can close the door on either side to give you an enclosed two-person suite at least. The single suites on the window was perfect for me today. The seats, although being a little old, were extremely comfortable. Now going around the seat, starting with the door jam. Here you can see there's a big cabinet. Inside that cabinet is a coat hook so you can hang things up and I did actually choose to hang my jacket up there. You can also fit bags in there if they work out. That being said, there's not a lot of in-seat storage for your bags. They wouldn't actually let me keep it under the footrest. Instead, they told me if it fit in the cabinet, I could leave it at my seat. Otherwise, I'd have to give it to them to store in a cubby with my roll-on bag. So instead, I pulled out what I needed and I let them store the rest in the cabinets. On the other side of the galley is where we found the storage cabinet where they were keeping everyone's rollerboard bags and their carry-on bags that didn't fit in their seat. So once I pulled out what I needed for this flight, I walked my bag over there and stashed it there. I also got a look at their grand staircase on the walk back to my seat where you can head up to their routine business class seats. Back at our own seat though, you can roll out the coat hanger here. Like I said, I used it to hang up my flannel, which I actually almost forgot. The flight attendant was super nice enough to check it, grab it for me, and run it to me right before I got off the airplane, which was awesome. Directly in front of you, you have a large TV screen, which isn't touchscreen. You do have to use the Seatback TV remote. Under that is another large footrest, but I actually couldn't reach it if I was sitting all the way back in my seat. That footrest does have a seat belt, so if you are traveling with someone else, they are able to join you in your suite and share your table for meals and whatnot so you guys can hang out together in flight. Now I do like touch screens, but considering how far the TV was, it probably wasn't the worst thing in the world. But when I say this TV was big, I mean it was massive. Here's my hand in reference to the TV. I don't even think my TV in my bedroom at home is that big. Just next to the TV though is where you're gonna find all the cubbies along the windowsill. The first cubby is your deepest, widest cabinet, so if you do have snacks or something on board you're trying to store, it's a great place to store that. Next to that is where the absolutely ginormous tray table comes out of. I pulled that out, but even with food and my laptop, I still couldn't use the entire tray table. So I guess if you do have a buddy that's using the lap belt across from you, there is more than enough space for both of you guys to share this tray table while you eat your food. Behind that is where you're going to find the Seatback TV remote, which obviously was the only way to control the Seatback TV. It's the normal style remote that you're finding in more and more business classes these days, so it had all the functionalities you were looking for, and considering you were pretty far from the TV, it was a great way to control the TV. And then one last cubby behind that was a general storage cubby with the headset jack and USB charging port. So I kept pretty much all my cords and devices stored here, although it was pretty far behind you unless you were in the recline position, which was kind of the only bummer with it. Then came the amenities for the seat, which is where one of my big criticisms come, which is that we didn't get any amenity kit. I don't know if it's the standard for this route or for Asiana in general, but for a first or business class seat, to not get an amenity kit is just kind of odd. We did get some amenities given to us separately, like this headset, which was all right. It was noise canceling, not the most comfortable thing in the world. We did get an eye mask and earplugs to help us sleep. And we did get slippers. Credit to them where credit is due. These slippers are probably the most comfortable in-flight slippers I've tried to date. 
In addition, we were given a very comfortable pillow, and along with that was a blanket that was kind of rough, but was branded with first class, which is kind of odd because there is no first class on Asiana. Now to the left side of my seat. First things first, you'll see a reading light and a literature pocket where everything was sanitized and kept within a nice plastic film. Below that was what looked like another TV screen. This one was specifically for adjusting the lighting, privacy, and seat adjustments directly from that screen rather than using individual buttons. Underneath the tablet was four preset modes for lie flat, relax mode, eating mode, and landing mode, in addition to a button that releases the tablet so you can use it pulled out of its slot. There was also a universal charging port under the footrest. Unfortunately, mine was inoperative, and so I was not able to charge my laptop on this flight. Shortly after that, they came around with pre-departure beverages. I went with my nice midnight champagne for this flight. Next to the cubbies is this giant trough. I'm assuming it's ventilation for the seat mechanisms, maybe the TV, but it was kind of a bummer just because it subtracted so much space from your suite and opened you up to the suites behind you while keeping you super far from the windows. Out those windows, however, we were able to see a Jeju Air 737, which is also going to Seoul Incheon, so you can either go there on this nice Asiana A380 or on that small little 737. Then I decided to check out the seatback literature we were given, which mostly just included a safety car, a duty-free magazine, and a thing to help us set up our COVID declarations for our entrance into Korea. Speaking of which, we were also given our customs declaration form and arrival cards, so that once we arrived at Korea, we were fully ready to just head straight through customs. Now, if you watch my channel, you know that I love when airlines are able to make bathrooms not just feel like small white boxes and any A380 first class bathroom seems to do just that. Asiana's was no exception. The walls and the doors had some great texture to help with the vibe like that. There's also this great counter that was separate from the counter with the sink that had some amenities with it. This long seat, which also doubled as the toilet if you raised the seat, which was a nice touch. And on the other side was the countertop with the sink and extra amenities. So it's a little bit smaller than most A380 bathrooms, but still grand. Just like the Qatar A380, you can lift up the seat cushion here in order to access the toilet, which you can use. But if you're not trying to use the toilet, maybe you're trying to change into your pajamas, you can use the seat for that. They did also give you plenty of amenities to keep yourself freshened up while you were on this flight. Although Emirates is the only one with an onboard shower, you can still keep your mouth fresh and keep yourself smelling good for your arrival. And then my favorite feature, which is ultra rare on airplanes, which is the lavatory window, which I realized on the ground was not great because people could probably see in, but in the air it's a nice touch because you have the ability to see outside while you're going to the bathroom. Now as we taxi out just a little bit about what this flight costs. Now it's really hard to get these first class seats with miles. You can get business class seats with miles, no problem. But if you want these first class seats, it's much easier if you just use money. Unfortunately, it does come with a little bit of an extra cost. For this flight, for example, you could book the normal business class seats for about $600 to $800, depending on what day you were looking. And you could account for about an extra $500 on top of that in order to upgrade to these business class suites. For this short of a flight, honestly, not quite sure if it's worth it. But if you are doing the flight from something like Los Angeles, to Seoul, where it's 10 hours or more, definitely worth every penny. Next up, I had to test out Asiana's in-flight entertainment system, something they're not exactly known for, so I didn't have much knowledge of what I would find on there. Now, when it comes to TV and movies, unfortunately, the selection was not great. As far as TV goes, there was only a few episodes of different shows from random seasons, and so it really only worked if you knew that show already. The movie selection was a little bit better. There was actually quite a few selections in many different languages. However, the English selections were pretty poor. I ended up having to watch movies that I never really would have considered watching outside of this flight. Now, like I mentioned, the Seatback TV is not touchscreen, so you do have to use the Seatback TV remote, but fortunately, it does pretty much work as a one-to-one -one screen, so anything that you would want to touch on your Seatback TV, you're able to use on the Seatback TV remote. The only drawback is that it wasn't exactly the most responsive from time to time throughout the flight, accidentally clicking things when I didn't mean to, or vice versa. Now where I thought their in-flight entertainment system thrived was the non-TV and movie options, actually the travel options. For example, of course my all-time favorite is the in-flight cameras where you can get a few different views from external views from different cameras outside the aircraft. 
In addition to that, there was a fantastic feature under the travel features for travel conversations in different languages, where in English, Japanese, or Chinese, you could learn how to say different phrases both in the airport, in the towns, at your hotel, whatever it might be. A fantastic feature I've never seen on other airplanes, but great if you're going to a country of which you don't speak the language. They also offer in-flight exercise guides, so no matter what cabin you're sitting in, you can arrive fully stretched and well rested. After that, I enjoyed checking out the About Asiana tab, where I could see things like their entire fleet, both on the remote and the CPAC TV, as well as their entire route map, where I could see exactly where they fly. I did finally settle on a movie to watch though shortly before departure, so I settled in and got comfy for my departure off to Seoul. As we taxied out though, it felt like Korea time considering the Korean air aircraft took off and then our Asiana aircraft and behind us the Jeju Air airplane going to Incheon all at the same time. I also got a view of this Thai Airways 747 which I was actually booked on in the first class cabin I was very excited for and then Thai decided it was the perfect time to ground the entire fleet of 747s. Speaking of grounding aircraft, it looks like Southeast Asia may not have completely recovered from the pandemic yet considering the sheer amount of aircraft that were parked here in Bangkok.
Shortly after takeoff with the lights dimmed, I saw possibly the greatest in-flight feature I've ever seen on board an airplane, which was a fake night sky, which was accomplished by embedding little miniature lights in the overhead panels. And if I was really trying to get a full night of sleep on this flight, oh boy, this would have made it so much cozier. Then it was time to shut the door, which was very hard to do one handed. You had to pull this latch to release it and then slide it shut. But after enough tries, I was finally able to get that. And so here's your view of the fully enclosed Asiana A380 business suite, formerly first class. I also decided it was time to get cozy, so rather than using the buttons attached to my seat, in this seat, like I mentioned, it's all done via the screen here. So I chose which pieces of my seat I wanted to recline and kick up, and I could set that up so I could get fully comfortable and relaxed. There's also a large amount of lighting that can be adjusted in here. For example, this lighting over the head, and there's also some matching lighting down on the footrest which helped to set the ambiance. You could turn that off and turn on and off the flood lighting for your suite from the panel in your seat as well, depending on how bright or dark you wanted it. As this flight continued and we got closer to sunrise, the mood lighting did shift. What didn't change, however, was the fake night sky above my head. Then it came down to in-flight Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, it looks like Asiana only has in-flight Wi-Fi on their A350 aircraft, so I was not able to connect on this flight. It was only about 5-6 hours anyway, so not the end of the world. And y'all, I'm sorry to keep showing videos of the ceiling here with the sky on it, but I do have to say that this cabin just got so darn comfy. I mean, before the flight, I literally slept in the airport so that I would be able to stay awake because the flight was only about five or six hours and I was struggling to stay awake. I was so comfy in my seat with the perfect lighting, the ceiling decorations, the slight bit of mood lighting they added here and there that in all honesty, I have to come back and try this cabin again on a longer flight so that I can fully take advantage of what it actually has to offer. Speaking of making the cabin cozy, one of the things that I had to look at was the galley because the galley sometimes can have some white flush out lights, but sometimes they can add some mood lighting and whatnot to make it a little bit cozier, especially in these double decker airplanes when they have to have the stairs going up to the upper deck. Here you can see the bluish purplish mood lighting and the lighting on the stairs with the map at the top made for a great ambiance over here. And just to the right of that was the lit Asiana Airlines logo in the galley, which just tied it all together. And now to show you just how much space we truly had, you can see with my laptop on the tray table, it still only used about 25% of the space. So that combined with the entire side panel where you could rest things on, made it so you had more than enough space for whatever you could need to use. But at this point, we were a couple hours outside of Seoul at this point. So the lighting was starting to come up, as was the sun, and it seemed like we were gonna be preparing for our only meal service of this flight. Now I will say whoever's in charge of the cabin lighting in this flight did a super job considering that the brighter it got outside as the sun came up, they adjusted the mood lighting to match that so that it got a little bit brighter, people naturally woke up without blinding us with the harsh white lighting. Right here you can see this is about as bright as it got as they prepared for our meal service until the sun was basically fully up. Speaking of meal service, it was about time for that so they gave me a refreshment towel and I got a mimosa that was mostly orange juice. The first course for me today was just a fruit platter. It came with some yogurt parfait on the side, but you can see here it didn't even take up half the tray table and I had the side panel next to me where I was able to continue working on my laptop. The fruit in Southeast Asia is always the highlight. So the fact that we were catered in Bangkok was a treat because especially the melons were absolutely fantastic and it's my favorite food to eat when I'm in Southeast Asia. Now, unfortunately, I do think it's because of a flight this length, but we didn't really have a whole lot of options as far as food went. I did enjoy the food that I got, but we were only given two options as far as our entree went today. So as the sun came up, I decided what I wanted and I placed my order. 
Today I went with the shrimp congee, which if you're not familiar with congee, it's basically a grainy type, almost like an oatmeal sort of dish, but it's native to Southeast Asia, so it's slightly different. This one comes with the spring onions and the shrimp as a topping. It's somewhat bland unless you add some flavor to it, but I thought mine was absolutely delicious on this plate. I just kind of wish we had a little bit more choice in terms of what we got to eat. Now that the sun was fully up, it gave me a chance to fully enjoy what this suite looks like when it's not pitch black outside, as the sun had basically fully arisen. And I do have to say that the seat is extremely comfortable, and with the door shut, it's super private. The only thing is the walls aren't very high, so if someone's walking by your suite, they can definitely see into your suite, at least see your face. So it's not exactly the most private suite in the world, but it's a closed door suite nonetheless, so can't have too many complaints about it. Now shortly before landing, they also showed a video from UNICEF and accepted onboard donations. I always try and donate a little something if I can, considering that if I have the means to, other people might not. Now the bottom deck of the A380, unlike the top deck, does allow you to see a little bit more of the two ginormous engines that power the Airbus A380. So our arrival into South Korea was made a little bit more special as those two engines just added to the wonderful view and scenery as we made our descent. Now that the sun had come up and illuminated the cabin, I got a chance to explore what the full cabin looked like a little bit better. From a normal standing point of view, you can see that you do have visibility into other people's private suites. So they're not the tallest or most private suites that exist, but the closed door definitely helps. That being said, let's take a little bit more of a look at my seat, 1K. You can see with the doors sliding open here, you have access to your suite and there's actually a ton of space that you have to utilize for storage and making yourself comfortable. Well, with our final approach into Seoul Incheon having commenced, it was unfortunate that this flight was so short, but in the meantime, I did get to enjoy at least my first daytime arrival into Seoul Incheon, and the two beautiful engines of the A380 definitely just made it a little bit more special.
And as we taxi into the gate, you know what time it is. It means that it's time for our final reflections and thoughts on the Asiana A380 First Class, or business suites as they're known as now. What I will say is that the seat seems to be a little bit outdated based on today's standards and what you could find on airlines like the revamped cabins of Emirates, Qatar, and Etihad, the big greats. But that being said, having a closed door suite is still a luxury, and I do find the seat itself to be insanely comfortable, especially with the full cabin feel. I would definitely fly this flight again. If I had the choice, I would do it on a much longer flight, so maybe I'll try and do that in the future. One thing I will say is this is my first time trying Asiana's Premier Class, and one of the things that I think struggles a little bit is when they downgrade this from a first class seat to a business class seat. The service does change slightly. As a matter of fact, the only time I saw the flight attendants rather than deplaning and boarding was when they served us the meal. Other than that, I never actually saw them when I went to the galley even, they weren't even there. I'm assuming they were hanging out with the main part of business class, but if this were a first class cabin, they would be super attentive. They'd be walking through the aisles to make sure you needed anything. But that being said, it was also a late night to sunrise flight. And so that could also have played a factor in it. They might've been assuming people were sleeping. Also not having amenity kits was kind of strange. I'm gonna chop that up to maybe just the length of this flight being somewhat shorter. So if I can definitely try out Asiana's long haul, first class or business class suites. I would love to compare it to my experience today just to see how it matches up. But now that we're heading into Seoul Incheon Airport, much more views of other Asiana aircraft, including a daytime view of our A380. But this was a very special flight. I'm glad that I was able to get on one of their A380s before they inevitably disappear. And let me know down below your thoughts on Asiana's A380s. Does it rank up with the other A380s of the world? Are you regretting the fact that they downgraded from first class to business class, even though it's the same seat? All thoughts that I would love to hear from you guys in the comments. But in the meantime, safe travels. I'll see you guys next time. Welcome to South Korea.